the state of the crypto market. I'm the altcoin analyst, nothing here is financial advice. Let's dive in. On the chart, we have Bitcoin. We can see that we're trading at around 51,300 as of recording. Now, I wanna highlight your attention to a previous area of resistance up here, which appears to be acting as resistance again. Now, if we kind of draw out some of our levels here and we mark out that 52,000 level, we take a closer look, we can see that we did get a slight deviation. The other level that I find interesting here is if we zoom back out is this level over here. We can zoom in on the daily and we see the upper level here at around 53,000 marked out where it acted as previous resistance over here. And then we went into a pretty nasty correction before kind of finishing that cycle. We went all the way down to almost a 25% correction. Now, in this uptrend, we haven't experienced a 25% correction yet. Is it possible that we could see something larger than kind of the 20 to 21% corrections we've seen? I think it's likely. Now, as you can see up here, we barely just touched that level and it acted as resistance up here. And if we draw out kind of our other level that we had at the $48,000 level, when we hit that level the first time over here, we immediately got rejected in a sell-off. And this is also the spot ETF approval. In my opinion, I think a steeper correction is in store before we kind of go off into our actual bull run. But one thing I want to point out here is why is everything rallying? Why are we so elevated? In my opinion, it's because the tether printers are continuing to pump liquidity into the crypto market. If we go all the way back to January of 2023, kind of in this area right here where we're sitting at 66 billion, we now have a market cap of 97 billion for Tether. So that's 31 billion of Tethers that were printed in 2023. I don't want to get into the conversation on whether or not Tethers are backed or Tethers are going to collapse. I, I simply am pointing out the fact that in 2023, 31 billion Tethers were printed. And at the same time, if we go to the Bitcoin chart, and if we mark out where that was in the Bitcoin chart, that was this area right here when the tether printers started to print. And so as you can see, we more or less followed pretty nicely the trend that is the tether market cap. Something to watch here is when the tether supply begins to contract a bit, I think we'll probably see a correlation within the market and starting to cool off for a bit. And so if we go back to the Bitcoin chart, I want to look at I want to take a look at some of my indicators that I have. And generally, one of the indicators I like to look at is the RSI divergence on a higher time frame. And so as you can see right here, we had a flash of some bearish divergence, which ended up correcting about 20 percent before ended up rallying again up into the $52,000 level. We can then go up to the weekly divergence. Some of the divergence is playing out on the weekly where we have the price of Bitcoin going higher, but the RSI going lower. And generally when you have the price moving up, but the relative strength index moving down, generally it's a sign that the price needs to return to equilibrium and we will see a longer and steeper correction. Now the three day didn't play out, but we can see in times where the weekly played out really nicely, and this is the weekly RSI divergence that played out over here marking the top, and then a bullish RSI divergence was forming over here, we had one little capitulation, before kind of showing that we were going off into an uptrend. So this higher time frame divergence can be useful in determining macro switches in the market from bearish to bullish or from bullish to bearish. Now, the next thing I wanna talk about here is the S&P. Why is the S&P important? Generally, the S&P and Bitcoin are correlated in macro time frame moves. So if we look on the daily, we might see some correlation, but generally the trend in both of them is very similar. And so we can go ahead and overlay Bitcoin here and we can see that we'll switch that to logarithmic. Generally in the larger macro moves by Bitcoin, we saw something similar in the S&P. So this correction right here, we saw a correction in the S&P. And so then we went on to rally right here and then Bitcoin ended up rallying as well. But we saw some divergence here where Bitcoin started to trend down and the S&P started to trend up. We then saw a pretty nasty correction by both Bitcoin and the S&P. And this was kind of that black swan event. And both of them ended up correcting pretty bad until they both went on into a nice, very nice bull run. And so at the top here, we saw a correction, a healthy correction by both of them. 
and again the s p corrected and since then they've both risen pretty nicely one of the ideas i have behind my bearish thesis is that we're going into a recession there's something notable here and that's there are some countries already in a recession Japan and Germany, I think, are the most recent. However, we can see a list of countries in a recession already. Just something more of a side note onto that. Jeff Bezos sold $2 billion worth of Amazon stock, taking a total sales over the past week to a total of $6 billion. So Jeff Bezos is selling billions of dollars of Amazon stock, kind of where the S&P might be at a local high. Who knows? The U.S. interest rates are one of the main reasons that I think a recession is coming because after we see the Fed hiking interest rates, we see a recession. Again, after the Fed hikes interest rates, we see a recession. Right here, the Fed has gone on to the most aggressive rate hiking cycle that they've had in the past 40 years. So that means the Fed has hiked rates at a less aggressive pace and we've still ended in a recession. And so given that fact, I think it's very likely that we end in a recession. And then when that happens, I think Bitcoin will probably roll over. Now, what do interest rates even mean? To kind of explain in a very simple example what these interest rates mean, I'm going to show you. So let's say you have a $100 house and a one-year loan. We're going to do one house at 0%. So we'll do 100 basically times 0% interest rate, which is 100. And we'll divide it by 12. And so we can see that we have an 83 payment each month for that year now if we do a seven percent interest rate on this house for a one year we can do 100 times 0.07 now if we add that to back to 100 and so if we do 107 divided by 12 our monthly payment is 8.91 so if we minus by 8.33333 in this example about 58 60 cents more expensive each month now, why does that matter? And so if we look at a company like Amazon, they have $130 billion of debt. And so some of the debt that they have, they're going to need to refinance. And when they refinance that debt, now their expenses go up. And so generally they have to cut other expenses elsewhere in the company. And generally that's payroll. And so that's why we see all these layoffs happening. Now, you might be asking, well, why do they have so much debt? In short, companies have tax savings that result from deducting interest from taxable earnings. So there's some tax benefits to having debt on your company balance sheet. Now, Amazon will probably survive through higher interest rates for a very long time, and they'll just end up laying people off or cutting other departments out and reducing their balance sheet elsewhere. However, now the people that don't have jobs are going to have trouble paying their bills and maybe their credit cards or their mortgage or something along that line, they might default and then the bank is liable for that. And so with this example with Amazon, we can think of maybe a smaller company that maybe just can't lay off a department or cut payroll elsewhere in their company. Maybe a company that has 10 to 50 employees. And so now when you have a smaller company going bankrupt, now that's put added stress on this bank. And so when you have all these things adding up, adding up over time, generally it leads into a recession. Circling back to crypto, when we see a recession in the stock market where we come down here, now I don't know how low we'll go. I don't think we'll go back to 28. I think Bitcoin, if that happens, will probably end up coming back down too. And so I think in the short term, we're probably going to see a correction to the downside, but also my longer term outlook for the next two, four, six months, maybe even eight months is slightly bearish until we actually get a correction because we've seen that there's quite a lot of liquidity up in here simply because the tether printers have been printing for the last year and a half. 30 billion tethers circulating are probably somewhere in the crypto market. Sometimes some of the altcoins might attract some of that liquidity. A lot of times it stays into Bitcoin, but either way, that's a lot of liquidity and it's not just going anywhere. And so something interesting that I think might play out is this pattern right here, where we've seen it happen before, but in either direction that Bitcoin moves, both the bulls and the bears are going to get nice and wrecked. And so generally speaking, I think that this is a reasonable outcome where we kind of go down and the bears are going to celebrate saying, hey, told you we're going lower. And then we go back up and the bulls are going to be like bull market confirmed 69K soon. And then we get rejected. And then ultimately, I think it's just going to be this back and forth game until we get a really nasty move in one direction or the other. I tend to think it'll be to the downside. 
And I mean, sure, there's always a possibility that we could break up. But I just don't think that's the case. We've never put in a new all-time high of the halving year in a Bitcoin four-year cycle. Right now, there's a lot of we're starting our bull run phase right now. And I just don't think that's the case. I think a lot of influencers try and use you as exit liquidity by getting you into the market. And I don't think that's the and I don't think they have the best intentions. And so I understand the bullish case of the ETF just got approved and the having and we see Michael Saylor on CNBC and four plus billion dollars of unrealized profit. And this all sounds good, but I think it's going to break to the downside. I don't think Wall Street wants you to get rich. I think it'll be interesting to watch the chart the next few weeks to months to see how this plays out. Because either way, regardless, I think we're going to spend a decent amount of time just kind of chopping up here. Even if this doesn't play out, I think there's a very good chance that we just kind of stay maybe in this range, in this range up here between range highs and kind of a, a range down here. I think that's very realistic as well. Maybe we just kind of chop up in here, kind of deviate both sides, deviate both sides until maybe it goes one way or the other. My whole point in starting this channel is to kind of be very honest and realistic because I don't think you get a lot of realistic price predictions in Bitcoin and the crypto space. I think it's either you see Peter Schiff saying we're going back to zero or you see Anthony Pompliano and Plan B saying we're going to a million dollars next year. Now, I know I don't know if Anthony Pompliano has actually stated we're going to a million dollars next year, but I know Plan B is very confident in this 500,000 price prediction next year, 500K. And so I just don't think that's realistic. And I think there's a need for a different perspective in the crypto space. So that's what I hope to provide. Last but not least, follow me on X. I like to post some interesting ideas there. And so, with that being said, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.